This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. I was glad when they said unto me, come into the house of the Lord. Welcome into worship this morning in our virtual space to praise our risen Lord today on the Lord's day.
please join me in a word of prayer. Spirit of the living God, come. Come and teach us, O Lord. Liberate us. Empower us and heal us. Lord, we pray that you would minister to our souls and our conditions. Come and open our hearts and minds and illuminate your word so that we might comprehend that which you desire for us to know this morning. Oh God, come and give us your living water that we may not thirst anymore. Heavenly dove, speak through me to your people so that they might hear a rhema word that will change and shift their situations. Lord, I surrender myself to you. And we honor you and we reverence your presence in this virtual, virtual worship space. Holy Spirit, come and feed us until we want no more. Have your way in our hearts and in our minds. Oh God, this is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, beloved, this morning I invite you to go with me to the Gospel of John. Our scripture reading will be in John chapter 4, verses 3 through 18 and 23 through 24. I will be reading from the New International Version. Hear ye the word of the Lord. So he, Jesus, left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Give me, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to come, keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go tell, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Verse 23, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Beloved, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For a time, beloved, I would like to preach and teach with this sermon title in mind, Jesus Changed My Story. I wonder if there is anybody in the chat room that can say that that is me. Jesus changed my story. That is my testimony. That is what I shout about today. I, what I used to be, I'm not anymore because Jesus changed my story. 
Y'all, as we settle into a new season in life after vaccinations and emerging into new protocols, you know, the new protocols, no masks are necessary inside if you are vaccinated. We are again adjusting to what we call a new normal, a new season in this pandemic. We are adjusting to what feels most comfortable to us or what feels safest to us today. However, y'all, before the pandemic, before we were advised to wear masks for our safety, there was what I'm calling uh, this uh, proverbial mask that some of us wore as a safety measure. Yes, this sort of masking is covering up your full potential, a masking of your vibrant personality, a masking of your deep passions for life, or a masking up what you have been through in order to fit in and not stand out in the crowd. Have you ever felt like you have had to show up a certain way in order to be accepted uh, by some people or even welcomed in uh, to certain spaces. Uh, the proverbial mask is intended to be a way to, you know, fit in and in a source of uh, security uh, to not stand out or be sometimes picked on. Uh, the young folk call it bullying. Um, however, the masking results in being uh, a measure to hide the most beautiful parts of ourselves uh, in order to escape the world's projection uh, of shame and judgment and inadequacies into our lives. Uh, we have had to no navigate uh, the masking of real emotion situations and circumstances uh, in various spaces before the pandemic. Uh, in the pandemic, uh, and even right now, uh, it is not only due to oppression in society, but also racial discrimination discrimination, uh, gender bias, uh, sexism, uh, misogyny or misogynoir, uh, homophobia or other forms of degradation, uh, even in our personal lives. Yes, even sometimes those closest to you uh, might remind you of your imperfections uh, and your inadequacies. Uh, we have had to navigate. Uh, if we will mask, uh, will we attempt to cover up our pain and our trauma? and our shame and self-doubt and fear, or will uh, we unmask and tell the real story, uh, the whole story, uh, and show the real emotion uh, and wrestle with the real injustices that we see every day uh, and fight for liberation? Uh, is something like this, mask on, uh, calm down your voice and control your emotions, uh, or mask off, shine like you are made to, uh, and let those tears flow and that righteous anger move you for justice uh, or mask on uh, my hips and my lips and my breasts are too big uh, why is your hair that color oh mask off uh, I'm perfectly and wonderfully created by an almighty God uh, my curves and everything that goes with me uh, mask on women can't be CEOs uh, senior pastors uh, presidents of organizations uh, mask off. God never said that. Uh, if you can do it, uh, then move through it uh, the best way that you can. Uh, or mask on. Uh, when are you going to get married? Or when are you going to have a baby? Or when are you going to have another baby? Mask off. Mind your business. Uh, mask on. Uh, you can't wear that. Uh, your shirt is too short. Your skirt is too short. Uh, your dress is too tight. Uh, why you got that on? Uh, cover your legs. Uh, well, Maya Angelou said it a little something like this. Uh, and still I rise. Uh, does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Uh, because I walk like I got oil wells in, oil wells pumping in my living room. Uh, does my sexiness upset you? Uh, does it come as a surprise uh, that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. Uh, out of the huts of history shame, uh, I rise up from the past that's rooted in pain. Uh, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping wide, wailing uh, and swelling. I bear in the tide, leaving behind nights of terror and fear. I rise uh, into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. Uh, I rise bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. 
slave, I'm the dream. And the hope of the slave, I rise, I rise, I rise. The point is when we decide to put the mask on, y'all, we negotiate giving up a part of ourselves in order to please other people. And to tell you the truth, I'm not about pleasing other people. I've done that before and the mask is coming off. I'm going to be everything that God has called me to be. And if you don't like it, you can take several seats. But when we take that mask off, y'all, we rise. We decide to live in the fullness of who God created us to be, uh, unashamed and unapologetic. Uh, and then the best parts of us began to rise. Just like the Olympic runner Shakira Richardson exemplified this well just this week. She earned her title as America's fastest woman in the U.S. track and field contingent, opening the way for her to run in Tokyo Olympics. If you have watched the clip of her race, y'all, right after she finished, she dashed up to the stands to hug her grandmother, who was one of her biggest supporters, along with other family members. Uh, she high-fived people as she was going up the stands because others were encouraged by her. But in the background, on social media, on that uh, gossip train, uh, people were talking negatively about her, about the color of her hair and the length of her nails. Uh, but when asked uh, by a reporter what she wanted the world to know, y'all listen up, pull your ear close. She said, uh, I want everyone to know that I'm that girl. Uh, every time I step on the track, I'm going to make my coaches proud, my family proud, uh, and use the gifts and talents God gave me. Uh, she says, mask off. I rise today. Uh, I am uh, that girl. Uh, I am the girl that wears colored hair. I am the girl that has long nails. Uh, I am who God created me to be, fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, and then she says, uh, check out the next hair color that I'm going to wear in Tokyo. I, I just believe somebody's getting ready to be set free today. Uh, and I just wonder, is there anyone out here to say uh, that, yeah, I'm that girl uh, and I'm that guy. Mask off. I don't care about what other people say about me. Uh, I am more than your opinion of me. Uh, I am more than your critique of me. Uh, I am a child of God. Uh, I'm beautiful with all my curves uh, and with all Oh, my black girl magic. Uh, I'm not the sum of what happened to me, uh, nor the result of my failures. I am more than enough. This wrestling, y'all, whether to mask by hiding parts of yourself or to unmask is what the woman at the well is negotiating as she makes her way to the well and encounters Jesus. I hope I painted the picture for you. One might ask, Pastor, how do you know this? Well, the Samaritan woman came to the well about 12 noon, which was a time when most people would not be at the well to draw water, y'all, because it was hot. It was hot like California hot, maybe 100 degrees hot. And people were like, I'm waiting till that sun go down until I, then I'll come to the well. Knowing that she came at this time helps to infer that she was avoiding or was maybe excluded from her society because of some issues. Or maybe the issues were people who oppressed her. In other words, part of her masking was carrying shame from her past and avoiding certain people who reminded her of the worst parts of her story. We don't know her whole story, but we can extract from the text that the Samaritan woman was bound by patriarchal societal structures that relegated her to silence, exclusion from society, devaluing of her voice and ostracized because of what she had done or maybe what had been done to her. Y'all, she was masked. Then this reality is paired with the dynamic of Jesus, a Jew, meeting her at the well. Now, it is important for us to know that Jews avoided Samaria because 
it was comprised of transplanted people. People who were no longer pure Jews, they were called half-breeds. Stay with me, y'all. I'm going somewhere. After the nation of Israel was split into northern and southern kingdoms, the northern kingdom's capital city became Samaria. And the southern kingdom's capital city became Jerusalem. Throughout scripture, it is recorded that the majority of kings of Israel, the northern kingdom that resided in Samaria, were wicked, unfaithful, and disobedient to God and supported idolatrous religious practices. Eventually, they were overtaken by the Assyrians and were assimilated into their native population by the Assyrians being sent, y'all, to Samaria and to enter into marriage with the native Jews. She had five husbands. The Assyrians were determined to erase the Jewish population, traditions, customs in order to transform their communities into Assyrian-dominated areas. They focused on impressing their customs, religious practices, and other ways of living into the community. The Jews remember this shameful history. So they traveled intentionally the long route around Samaria around the Jordan River instead of the more direct route through Samaria. So when we read in the text that Jesus had to go to Samaria, it begs for us to ask why. Why doesn't Jesus take the traditional route around instead of going the shorter route through Samaria? Well, theologian Miguel de la Torres points out Jesus knows something uh, about not being accepted uh, like this Samaritan woman. De la Torres says, Jesus Cristo is a street rat, uh, a borough kid, uh, a speck from the wrong side of the tracks, those who came from Nazareth. Y'all remember in the scripture where the question was asked, can anything good come uh, from Nazareth. Uh, those who came from Nazareth, like Jesus, were looked down upon, uh, mainly because large portions of the Jews living in the area were Hellenized or mixed race. Uh, in other words, Jesus uh, knew what it was like to be ostracized uh, and excluded because of race. Uh, therefore, part of Jesus' intentionality in going to Samaria was to provide restoration uh, full inclusion uh, and love opposed to the pattern of exclusion uh, and avoidance uh, that other Jews embodied. Uh, so I submit to you today that when Jesus uh, sat at the well uh, on that day uh, and came to draw water, he thirsts for her uh, to be made well. Uh, and so it is Jesus decided that he had to go through Samaria and not go the long route uh, around Samaria in order to meet the Samaritan woman at the well, uh, choosing to restore her uh, and all of Samaria through her. Uh, remember her testimony uh, about Jesus uh, brought others to Jesus too. Uh, I believe she might have preached her initial sermon uh, when she went back to her people uh, to tell them all about what Jesus had done in her life. Uh, and he invited her uh, to take her mask off uh, and and be uh, made well. Uh, and I just wonder if there are two or three men or women uh, listening to today uh, that can say, Jesus met me in uh, my Samaria. Jesus met me in the place where other people silenced me uh, and other people walked around me uh, and other people wouldn't even look at me uh, and other people oppressed me uh, because of my race, uh, because of the color of my skin, uh, because of the size of my body, uh, because of the disability I had, uh, because of the mental illness I was struggling with, uh, because, 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 uh, but Jesus uh, met me in my Samaria and made me well. Uh, has Jesus ever come to you uh, when you were in a low place uh, and you didn't have anyone to talk to about it, uh, but the spirit of the living God uh, came and spoke a word that gave you strength to keep on pressing forward. 
I just wonder if you have anyone here that can testify that Jesus met me at my well in Samaria. He met me at my well of despair, of depression and anxiety and sadness and pain and sickness and worry. Jesus met me at my well and when I didn't know what I was going to do and I cried all night long. But when I opened my eyes, hallelujah, I found Jesus waiting to make me well. Jesus, y'all, I already told you he didn't follow the tradition. He didn't follow the tradition of going around going around Samaria, going by the Jordan River, going by, going around to avoid certain things. Uh, Jesus didn't follow tradition, traditional worship, traditional ways in which you serve people. Jesus went to this woman and waited on her. Jesus followed the spirit of the living God. Because his call was to follow the spirit of God to go into places where other people would not go. And I just wonder if Jesus is calling you to not go the traditional route, not do the traditional things that the church is doing, because that's not the way necessarily that you uh, may be reaching out or God is calling you to do the thing that God wants someone to be touched and to be healed. Jesus doesn't follow tradition. Jesus follows the spirit of the living God. So Jesus meet her, meets her and begins to change her story. Jesus meets the woman at the well in a convergence, y'all, of masking, weighted down by the troubles of this world as Jesus invites her to take the mask off. Y'all, here we begin to see the unveiling of her healing story. For it is at Jacob's well in Sychar that the healing happens. It is at Jacob's well that Jesus sits and engages in conversation with this woman who comes to draw water. Now, for us to understand what is happening here, we got to fully understand the context of Sychar. Sychar was also known as Shechem. Shechem was the place of historical promise. In Genesis 12, Abraham, the chosen one of God and the father of many nations, erected the first altar to the Lord, and the Lord said to him that his offspring would receive the land in Shechem, the promised land. Y'all know the land that was flowing with milk and honey. In Genesis 33, Jacob, Abraham's grandson, pitched a tent and erected an altar at Shechem. In Genesis 35, Jacob erected an altar again to repent for worship of foreign gods and hid them under an oak tree that was near Shechem. In Genesis 37, Joseph, Jacob's son, with a promise and destiny in his heart and on his life from the dream God gave him. Y'all remember, he sold by his brother into, brothers into slavery at Shechem. Deuteronomy 27, Moses commanded Israel to cross over the Jordan River and place the stones as a reminder of the Lord's favor to enter into the promised land at Shechem. And in Joshua 24, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to renew the covenant and Joseph's bones were buried in Shechem. What I'm trying to help us understand here is that Shechem is a place of historical promise and pain. Jesus met the woman at the well carrying her pain in a place of promise of the flow of milk and honey abundance while sitting at the well and meeting Jesus, a spiritual well that holds healing power as living water. All I'm trying to say, y'all, and all I'm trying to get y'all to understand is the place oftentimes of your greatest pain may also be the place of your greatest promise and and destiny. You know, Whitley Phipps says it this way, and I've told y'all before, it is in the quiet crucible 
of your personal private sufferings that your noblest dreams are born and God's greatest gifts are given in compensation, in compensation for what you've been through. The place of your greatest pain is oftentimes where God wants to use you for his glory. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And I just wonder if there's anybody here that can testify that God turned my pain into promise. God used my pain for his glory. God got the glory out of my life. God will transform your pain and use it to be the birthplace for your greatest dreams and your most powerful ministry. I am a testimony. And I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but don't trust what you see right now. But put your trust in a God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ever ask, think, or imagine according to the power, the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in you. Y'all, the place of your greatest pain, I'm going to say it again, is oftentimes where God wants to use you for his glory. And then Jesus invites her to accept this living water, the living water that will transform her life, the living water that transforms her story. In verse 13, Jesus offers her living water and she replies with excitement, y'all with excitement. She's like, how can I have this water? How can I have this living water? Because she's, ex she's excited because she wouldn't have to come to the well. She wouldn't have to come and continue to deal with being ostracized. She wouldn't have to come and continue to deal with the shame, y'all. She could even sit at home and keep her mask on and not even have to deal with it. She could waddle in her pain. I believe Jesus' response shocked her. I believe it shocked her because she was expecting that she wasn't expecting what she um, actually heard him say. She was expecting and thinking about all the ways she could just chill and not have to work to come get water from this well. But Jesus' response wasn't a common response. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I know she was like, what? How you know about that? She replied, I have no husband. To which Jesus responded, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, the truth is, you have had five. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Have y'all ever prayed and Jesus told you the whole story, the real story, and you didn't even know that Jesus knew? Because somehow y'all thought that Jesus really didn't know that because you had that in the closet. You really thought Jesus didn't know it. But Jesus will put it straight in your face and in front of you because he wants you to face it. Beloved, the process of healing begins by telling the truth. The living water sets us free from the lie, the shame, the false narrative that is running in our minds about who we are, the things that our parents or people whom we thought loved us did or said about us. In order to take the mask off, be made well, Jesus invited her into a conversation. Jesus invited her to open up that deep place, that deep-seated thing in which she thought that she was that was what that was being hidden from Jesus. Jesus invited her into a conversation, something like therapy, to face the stories that she had believed that were not that were true, that were really not true about her and maybe some things that she had covenanted with, some of those things that she had created a covenant with that really did not belong to her, and, and she needed to believe the truth. Some of the things that people put on us are transference from their past, and they, don't, and they projected their pain onto our lives, inviting us to hold on to their baggage and claim the lie as if it belongs to us, and it doesn't belong to us. Maybe a parental figure or a friend or acquaintance told you that you will never be anything. That's not true. That was what they wrestled with. It doesn't belong to you. The Lord says you are more than enough. Maybe a teacher said that you aren't smart and will not be able to accomplish that goal. That's not true. 
you are able to reach the fullest potential with the help of God, all things are possible. Maybe you were told that you wouldn't be able to be a successful career person because you had a baby early. The devil is a lie. You are a child of God empowered by the spirit of God and the Lord uh, will get the glory out of your life. Uh, I like India. I read in her song, I Am Light. She says it like this. Uh, I'm not the things my family did. Uh, I'm not the voices in my head. Uh, I'm not the mistakes that I have made uh, or any of the things that caused me pain. Uh, I am not the pieces uh, of the dream I left behind. Uh, I am light. Uh, all I'm trying to say here is being open uh, to receive the living water is stepping into a journey of wholeness uh, that first uncovers the lie so that you can live in uh, the truth. Um, at some point, y'all, the woman of Samaria had five husbands, uh, but when she met Jesus, uh, she told the truth uh, about her current situation. Uh, yes, uh, she told the truth uh, about her current situation. Uh, saying yes to Jesus uh, is saying yes to a journey uh, of healing and restoration uh, as Jesus helps you face some hard things uh, that have been detrimental to you in your past. Uh, the process of healing uh, Y'all, it might take years of therapy to reshape toxic patterns uh, from your childhood uh, or to heal for some things uh, that were done to you uh, and you had no voice in the matter or to help you to claim the full essence uh, of who you really are uh, as a child of God. Uh, God is calling forth the real story uh, so that you can dispel the lie and live in the truth and the living water, y'all. It helps you to uncover the layers of trauma and lies that took you out of your truth. Uh, the living water is a spring that comes forth uh, so that you will never be thirsty again. Uh, the living water will spring up in your mind when a toxic thought comes. Uh, I can't do that. Uh, I'm a failure. I'm not good enough. The living water will remind you that's not who you are. Beloved, today Jesus uh, is sitting at your well uh, of pain uh, and looking into your promise uh, meeting you at the place of pain uh, you keep returning to uh, because it's more familiar to you uh, and saying uh, that is not who you are. I want to change your story. You keep returning to the promise, but that is not who you are. You keep returning to Jacob's well, but I want to be your nourishment. Jesus is saying, I want to change your story. I want to change the way you see yourself so that you will know the truth of who you really are. Jesus is changing the words that you tell yourself. You are not what was done to you. You are the beloved. You are not what other people call you. You are the child of the most high God. You are not worthless. You are worthy to the Lord. You are not useless. You are more than enough. God is changing your story. And y'all, I close with this story. On Saturday morning, me and my brother went go-kart riding with my parents. My dad had built us a go-kart. We were pretty proud of it, y'all. I think the engine is actually still in our garage. Yeah, it really is. It was a one-seater. It was black and red. And we were excited every time that we could get on that go-kart. Now, this was before go-karts were at Frankie's and the Speed Park that we had a good time going to this Saturday with the youth. It was may I was maybe like in the fifth grade when I was allowed to drive. And I would always have a hard time remembering which pedal was the gas and which one was the brake. I just couldn't remember, y'all. My dad would uh, drive us to an empty parking lot so we wouldn't hit nothing, of course. So we had plenty of room to drive around. And this Saturday morning, I was driving and came around a corner extremely fast because, y'all, it was one of those moments. I mixed up the gas and I mixed up the brake. And I just kept hitting both of them at that point. I was like, I just want to stop. So I just kept hitting them. And if you know me, at some point, y'all, I started crying and I was terrified. Before I was headed, and I was headed towards a brick wall. 
But before I got to the brick wall, I had to pass by my father. When I passed by my father, y'all, yo, yo, he dove out quickly and hit the off switch at the back of the go-kart. And it stopped before I hit the wall. And I just wonder if I have two or three listen today that can testify that when God stepped into your life, whenever it was headed for destruction, and God flipped the off switch, and he stopped it before you were going to turn, go into destruction and turn your life around. And Jesus, you can testify today that Jesus change your story. Jesus told you, you will not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Your marriage won't die. Your career won't die. Your mind won't die. Your children are going to be okay. That dream is coming together. You will live and declare the works of the Lord. I'm through y'all today, but I just wonder if there's anyone else as excited as I am to declare that my life is is not over. I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Jesus has met me at my well and changed my story. If Jesus has met you in your pain and changed your story, can you just give God some praise in the chat room? We praise the Lord because we know the pain will work out according to God's purpose and God's plan. The best is yet to come. The latter days will be greater than the former days. It's not over until God says it's over. God will fight every battle and God will win. Won't you praise the Lord with me today, saints? God will restore the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm and the great army of the Lord will fight every battle. When we pass through the waters, God will be with you. And when we pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Uh, when we walk through the fire, we will not be burned. Uh, the flames will not be set ablaze onto us because the Lord God, uh, our Father, the Holy One of Israel, uh, our Savior, is watching over us. Uh, for God has cared for us uh, since we were born uh, and has carried us uh, before we were born uh, and will be with us uh, throughout our lifetime. Uh, Y'all until those hairs turn gray. God made us. God carries us. God cares for us. God saves us. God watches over us. God intercedes for us. God strengthens us. God meets you in your pain and will change your story. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And thanks be to God. We are grateful today that God will change our story. If you are in the midst of a painful situation, if you are wondering what are you going to do, I incline you to just listen to the sweet sound of the Holy Spirit beckoning you, calling you to just hear a word that will change your life. God meets us at our wells in our Samarias not for judgment, but for freedom, for healing, for wholeness, because God desires that we are made well. Sometimes it's moments of brokenness which create the greatest transformations. Times where fear gives birth to faith, pain leads to healing, and chaos dissolves into peace. It's in these times we often see God more clearly. For in our deepest turmoil, He remains faithful. When our spirit is crushed, He remains strong. When our moment is too heavy, He carries the burden. As gold is refined by fire, we too are often refined by struggle. It's part of growing, changing, becoming. 
Lately, the journey has been difficult. Our breath has been labored. Our steps uneasy. But we stand in faith, knowing who is leading us through this desert. The God of peace, the God of hope, the God of restoration. Beloved, it is wonderful to have you with us today, and we hope to see you next week at the same space at the same time. Have an amazing week, and may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may his love and his peace and his grace shine upon you, and may the Holy Spirit give you power, authority, and strength to move through every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace. <laughs>